The Lord brings us all together um, to infuse his word and his spirit in our lives so we can go out into the world that is around us and make a difference. One of the things that tries, the adversary has tried over and over and over and over and over to try to keep God's people from doing God's work is persecution and suffering. It's one of those few things that come in life that we don't have to pray and believe God for. It's one of those things that we as Americans oftentimes think has no real impact on us. And so we oftentimes kind of just put it off to the side. Tonight I want to talk for a few moments on life in the spirit. is not life without suffering, but a life that suffering does not control. Just repeat that after me. Suffering does not control me. When we come to a point where we are servants of the Lord, and when we are followers of Jesus, when we come to a point where we understand that suffering will come into our life in one form or another, but it's not going to control us. The adversary loses an enormous amount of influence over your life. When we have a commitment, in the Bible many times it talks about patience and faithfulness and long-suffering, these qualities that need to be on the inside of us. And maybe we aren't facing a prison term, or maybe we're not phys- uh, facing uh, 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 um, being a martyr. But in the same sense, the adversary will come and try. What is the number one reason why American Christians don't witness? They are afraid of rejection. It is a form of suffering. We don't want to encounter suffering. And your flesh never wants to encounter suffering. I'm not into martyrism. I'm not looking to, to, to suffer. But I'm also understanding that I'm not going to allow it to control my life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ either. Now we've said it last week and we'll get into it a little bit later. But we'll say just so that no one gets, gets lost even from the beginning. And if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We don't have to suffer for things that Jesus suffered for us in redemption. The things that he suffered for us, the things that he took care of, we don't have to suffer in the sense to pay for our sins. He has, through the power of redemption, has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We don't have to suffer along those lines. But in this world, there is still forms of suffering that we will encounter because we are followers of Jesus. And if we preach a message that people think that if I'm going to follow Jesus, that everything is just going to be comfortable in my life, the moment there is discomfort, they want to give up on God. And all the enemy has to do is bring a little persecution into our life, a few people that make fun of you because you go to church, a few people that give you other opportunities to do other than read your Bible, other opportunities other than live the witness of Christ in your life. We quit and we give up because we thought it was going to be comfortable, easy. But it's at a point where folks, to be followers of Jesus is not for the faint of heart, but those that are committed in their lives. The wonderful thing is that Jesus has a great place prepared for us called heaven. I thought a couple people maybe be going there. I mean, he's got a great place prepared for us. And yet there are some days between here and there that we must understand that we're going to have to have some strength and courage to go through. Suffering has been and always will be a part of the followers of Jesus. Our leader, Jesus himself, was known for the suffering that he went through. Not just the redemptive part of suffering, but the things that he encountered, those that rejected him, those that lied about him, those that made up stories about him, people that thought he was crazy, constantly were trying to kill him. Not because of the wrong that he had done, but because the God of this world system, Satan, is, is, is angry, he is mad. And he wanted to destroy Christ and all the followers of Christ. The early church leaders suffered for such things as preaching Jesus, healing the sick, and loving those that were different than them. Suffering as followers of Jesus should not surprise us nor stop us, but in a sense should encourage us when we get a hold of this. Listen to, the word, what, uh, to a situation here in Acts chapter 5. The last part here, verses uh, 40 and 42. This is where the disciples had been taken into, cap, uh, into, uh, um, uh, they, uh, into jail. And uh, they were uh, brought into, uh, um, because they were out there preaching Jesus. 
and amazing things were happening. Uh, the lame were walking. Um, people's lives were being transformed and changed. And so what happened is the religious people, especially at the time, uh, and they had the authority because of the government, uh, the Roman government had given to them, so they put him in prison. And this is what they decided to do with them. Verse 40, uh, summing the apostles, they flogged them and sternly forbid them to speak, not to speak in uh, or about the name of Jesus, and they allowed them to go. So they went out from the presence of the council, the Sanhedrin, the religious council, rejoicing. Now, most of us would be rejoicing because they let us go. But they were rejoicing. What were they rejoicing about? They were rejoicing, these apostles were rejoicing because they were being counted worthy, dignified by the indignity to suffer shame and to be um, to exposed to the disgrace for the sake of his name. They went out of that place freshly flogged, beaten, and th threatened. Don't you do this again. And they went out with a sense of honor that they had encountered suffering because of their association and because they had been obedient to preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet in spite of the threats, they never ceased for a single day. Can you say a single day for me? They didn't wait till next Sunday. They didn't wait till next Wednesday night. They didn't wait till next Bible study. They didn't wait till the next time a few uh, uh, faithful Christians got together in a secret location. But they, in spite of the threats, they never ceased for a single day, both in the temple and at home, to teach and to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. In spite of the suffering that never controlled the decisions they made in their lives to be a faithful father follower of Jesus. And I, I, this is, folks, this is, as a pastor, it's my responsibility not only to preach to you the promises of God, but to be able to preach to you the responsibilities as a follower of Jesus in your life. And to be able to let you know there are going to be times of suffering that come into our life, not because you've done something bad, but because you are a follower of Jesus. And we need to get a hold of the understanding that life in the Spirit gives me this understanding. They don't like me because I'm a follower of Jesus. They're just mistreating me because I'm a follower of Jesus. And I'm not mad at them. I'm actually honored that they know I got Jesus in my life. It encourages us. Billy Graham says it seems that when one person stands up, a lot of other people get stronger backbones. It starts to encourage other believers that are around us. We need to understand that our proper perspective of suffering is not that we are glorifying God because of bad things that are happening to us, but we glorify God that when bad things happen to us, we don't give up and quit about following Jesus in our lives. There's an old song, and we'll sing it later, I have decided to follow Jesus. Have you heard that one before? Have you sang it lately in your life? I've decided to follow him. Making that commitment in our lives, that bedrock determination, that regardless of what happens around us, Romans chapter 8, we've been going through this chapter, we're going to read a few more verses tonight, we're going to look at a couple of these and stir on the inside of us, life in the spirit, sometimes we think life in the spirit is just when we all get together and pray in tongues and prophesy over a few people, we think life in the spirit is just having a few visions or a few dreams or, or life in the spirit when we go to heaven, folks, when persecution comes against us, we need to be living in the power of the Spirit in our lives. We need to have it come alive on the inside of us for our witness for Christ. Here in Romans chapter 8, and we'll jump down here um, to verse 18. We talk not only about the future glory that is waiting for us, and we love heaven and thank God for heaven. Thank God for heaven. Thank God for heaven. Thank God for heaven. But we've got some days between here and there that we need to learn how to live while we're in this world where there is a God of this world system that hates us and wants to try to stop the, the church from going forward. And that we don't want to just hang out 
and in secret place, nor just try to hold on till Jesus comes, but we need to be making advancements for the kingdom of God, and it's going to take encountering opposition, it's going to take encountering some discomforts to the flesh, it's going to take encountering some problems in life, but we're overcomers in Christ Jesus. Here Paul writes to us, the church in Romans chapter 8 verse 18, he says, yet, yet, What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Walking in the Spirit is where I keep reminding myself when they say ugly things about me, it's not that they hate me, it hates what the Jesus is in me. When problems come that the enemy throws at me, the discomforts, the persecution, the suffering, when I go forward, this is nothing compared to the glory that's waiting for me. Because if I want this world to be, this world, when I'm in this world, I mean my world. I mean my little world. The world called not earth, but me, myself, and I world. When I want that world to be comfortable and perfect, if I'm not careful, I'm willing to give up my faith in Christ for present comforts in this world. But when I keep a hold of the future glory, not just the palace that I get when I get to heaven. Not just the, the, the rewards that I get when I get to heaven. I get to be with Jesus. Even if there wasn't a palace, even if there weren't rewards, even if there weren't golden streets, I get to be with Jesus for eternity. Looking forward, Paul encourages them. He goes on here, verse 19, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal to who his children really are. Against its will, all creation is subject to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to this present time. And we believe also, and we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of that glory. He's saying the Holy Spirit is in us as a foretaste, a guarantee, a down payment of of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. That the Holy Spirit that's in us and now we're going to get to live in his presence as we go forward. Listen, this foretaste. Part of what it's there for, excuse me, he's there for is for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. The Apostle Paul, this great preacher that preached more on being an overcomer and this great uh, uh, apostle that preached on this is the, the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. He lets us know that in this world we're going to be constantly tempted to sin and we're going to encounter suffering while we're in this world. And we don't even have to say amen because it's going to be so. Now, again, I'm not saying that we have to suffer for things that Christ has redeemed us from. But in this world, there is going to be discomfort that hits our flesh. Have you ever heard someone say something like this? Why would God let something like this happen? And there is inside of us a thought that if God was so good, then he shouldn't let bad things happen on this earth. The thought is that God has a perfect place for us where he rules supreme in a sense of everything. But in this world, there is a God of this world system called Satan. And sin is present in this world. And there is suffering in this world. Now, Christ has redeemed us, but we're still constantly fighting the enemy in our life. And Paul says we're looking forward to that day when not only is the enemy gone, but we get new bodies. Glory, hallelujah. He says, so we too wait for that eager hope for that day where God will give us our full rights as adopted children, including new bodies, as he promised. We, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have, have received this or received something, we don't need to hope for it. But we look forward to something we don't have We must wait patiently and confidently. Everyone say patiently. There's some suffering right there, huh? (laughs) Patiently doesn't mean that you just sit there and wait for it. Patiently, over and over through Scripture, when it says patiently, means consistently. Regardless of what's happening, 
you're going to act the same way. Regardless of the suffering, regardless of the discomfort, regardless of the, of the persecution, you're going to act the same way as you do on Sunday morning when everyone's shouting praise the Lord, hallelujah around you. When, every, when the mob says, I want, to, I want to kill you, we still act the same way. We still are trusting in the Lord in our life. In times of suffering, we need to look at that future hope and that gives us a guidance of how we should live to our daily life. We have the Holy Spirit in us to be able to give us that patience, that consistency, that, 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 that stir, sturdiness in our lives so that we can go through problems that come our way, especially persecution and suffering that the enemy would throw against us. Following Jesus does not mean everyone likes us, but that we have divine peace in us. Will you please stop trying to get everybody to like you? When Jesus himself says, because you're my followers, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And the only way we can get everybody to like us is if we stop being like Jesus and we start being like everybody else. So we have this divine peace on the inside of us. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. We're talking tonight about dealing, preparing ourselves to go through the, dis- the discomforts, the sufferings that the adversary would throw at us, and so that we don't give up and we don't quit in our following of Jesus. We could, ch- we could fill every one of these, cha- these chairs time and again with people that used to follow Jesus. Do you know anybody that used to follow Jesus? Used to be fi- on fire for God? Used to be involved in the ministry? Used to? But then the problems of this world... The suffering, the persecution that comes to steal away the word in their life. And they give up. And they die. They give up. But folks, we're not going to give up. Can I get a little bit more confident? Because, amen, we're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. Because we're keeping our eyes on the future glory. And the future glory that's waiting for us, this present suffering has nothing compared to that. You know, we uh, had a couple get married last week, got a couple getting married this week, and there's some wonderful, wonderful future days ahead for them. But how many of you know that there's going to be some discomfort in the days ahead for them also? Uh Uh-huh. Everything isn't going to go their way every time. There's going to be some... So why would they get married if there's going to be some discomforts? Because of the future hope that they have. The good's going to far outweigh the bad. As we follow after Jesus, I want you to know, in the days ahead, you're going to have some discomforts. Not because of Jesus, but because of this world that we live in. But the good far outweighs the bad when we go forward in God. Listen to the words of, that Paul writes here to the church in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 4 through 10. He says, in everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles. This is the Apostle Paul. We patiently, there it is, that, that acting the same all the time. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We've been beaten, but we've been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and, and gone without food. How many of you want to sign up for this job we're talking about right here? For this, this, this is a job, uh, uh, what am I looking for? A um, um, job description. Thank you for whispering that out, whoever did. Here's a job description. We don't think of this. We think of the Apostle Paul of, as somebody that would have great oratorial abilities and amazing miracles that happened in his life and true. But he's saying, here's some other things that happened along the way. He said that angry mobs and worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, gone without food. We proved ourselves to be uh, uh, proved ourselves by our own purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. Verse seven: We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapon of righteousness in the right hand for attacks and the left hand for defense. We serve God with people who honor us or dishonor us, we, whether we are slandered or whether we are praised. We are honest, but they call us imposters. 
We are ignored even though we are well known. We live close to death but still alive. We have been beaten but we are not killed. Our hearts ache but also have joy. We are poor but our spiritual riches we give to others. We own nothing and yet we have everything. Folks, this person's either got a hold of something or they're really messed up. The question is, do you have a hold of something in your life to have this understanding come alive on the inside of us of what it is to live in the spirit, that what we really have, this joy, this peace. Remember the old song, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Keeping it alive on the inside of us so that when we go through these times, these moments, these, these dark times, these times where we seem isolated and forgotten, we keep our eyes on what God has promised and the Holy Spirit who is alive on the inside of us. That's life in the Spirit that we're talking about here. It does not mean that we're going to have a life that has no discomforts to them from the flesh, but a life that is living by faith every day of our life. A couple of quick scriptures. You might just want to write these down, look them up later if you want to. We're, you know, just by time we're going to have to zip through here. But 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3, again, Paul writing to Timothy. Now, most of Paul's writings about persecution, most of Paul's writings that you would look at are given to illustrations of people in the ministry. And you would think as you look around the world, because we often hear of this pastor, maybe this put in prison, we think of these missionaries that were maybe killed. But if you will look at the statistics of the hundreds of thousands of Christians that have lost their life, the vast majority of them were not in the ministry. They were just believers that did not give up their life. So we're not saying that this is just something for the fivefold ministry. This isn't just something for a few preachers that they got to live, but that every one of us are willing to live. Paul writing to Timothy, he says, you know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from it all. Verse 12, though, he says, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Most of us don't have that as a refrigerator magnet. Huh? Most of us don't want to think about that. Most of us think this would be a bad confession if I say I I will suffer persecution. No, we say I will be prepared to suffer persecution. I'm not looking for it, but when it comes my way, I will overcome it. When it comes my way, I will endure it. And And when it comes my way, it will not control my life. He goes on and says, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and themselves be deceived. We have to understand that in this world, that those that are coming against us are deceived and they're going to try to deceive others, but that's the necessity of the truth being preached. And that truth is our lives, living the truth every day. Living our lives, a truth of following after Christ. So the two things that I want to break down with this real quickly that about this, this understanding and sharing in the future glory means I'm going to go through some present suffering in my life. First of all, the glory is not in the suffering. Some religions have really gotten this messed up and they think that if you're suffering, the more you suffer, the more God likes you. The more you suffer, the better Christian that you are. And so we, they, they cause things to suffer their lives. There was a group that years, you know, back in, in history that, that actually would whip themselves. And they would think because of the suffering that they would cause to their physical body that it would please God and drive, you know, pay for their sins. Others that would do things that would, would, would cause pain into their physical body, uh, physical suffering to them. They would think that it would please God. I want you to know there's a devil out there that, if, that, that is well able to cause suffering in our life. We don't need to help him out. We're not, we're not trying to help him out along the way here. The glory is not in this suffering, but the glory is in our union with Christ as his children. That we stay focused on our spiritual connection with Christ no matter the physical cost along the way. Here's a scripture again that 
sometimes we just struggle. As we said Sunday, we call Jesus Lord, but do we live by his teachings and his lordship over our life? Matthew chapter 5, we have the amazing beatitudes that are revealed to us in Jesus' great teaching to his followers. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. Doesn't that sound odd? Now notice it didn't say that God causes problems in their life. But, it's, but it says God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of God is theirs. It goes on in verse 11. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you. And say all sorts of evil things about you. Underline. Because you are my followers. Now, if they're saying bad things about you because you're doing wrong things in life, you're not going to get blessed by God. But he says here, when, we're, when they're doing this because we're followers of Christ, God blesses you. You want to be blessed to the Lord? How many of you want to be blessed to the Lord? Here's one way we're blessed. See, we want the blessings of the Lord with, with, no, with no persecution along the way. With no discomfort to the flesh along the way. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a, a great reward awaits you in heaven. Here we are talking about that future glory. A very great reward waits for you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets are persecuted in the same way. The next thing we could just also just be, uh, thought about here on this dealing with the suffering that comes into our life correctly. Is we do not have to suffer in areas that Christ has redeemed us. But, but... We will have to be faithful in times of persecution. We will. There's times we can rebuke the adversary, and there's times we just outlive the persecution and follow Christ along the way. Scripture, you can write it down. Jesus himself says in John 16 33, the Amplified Translation, it says, I have told you these things. Jesus is speaking. Listen, Jesus is speaking here. 1633, John 1633, Jesus is speaking to us. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you will have perfect peace. Doesn't that put a smile on your face? In me you'll have perfect peace. Regardless of what's happening in your life, Jesus has given you perfect peace. Complete peace. Peace on the inside. Peace and confidence. Listen, in the world you will have tribulation. In the world, you will have trials. In the world, you will have distress and frustrations. Has anybody found out this scripture to be true? You don't have to be in the world too long. But this is the wonderful life in the spirit is even though in this world, all of these storms are going on around us, we still have perfect peace in us. And the devil can't do nothing about it. His peace, his calmness in our lives. No matter what the persecution, no matter what the suffering, no matter what the lies, no matter what the accusations, no matter what the thoughts, no matter what the, what the, the demonic influence might be around us, we, Jesus said, and if there's anybody you can believe, you can believe Jesus. Jesus said, we'll have perfect peace he says, for, for I have overcome the world. I've deprived it from the power to harm you and have conquered it for you. God has given us the ability to have peace on the inside of us because of redemption, regardless of what's going on around us in this life. Again, just write the scripture down. But in 2 Timothy 2, in the King James, verse 11 through 13, it says, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, speaking of Christ, we shall also live with him. Amen. Amen? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We spoke of it a little bit last week, and I just want to reiterate it again tonight, to stir it on the inside of us. I'm not believing for some great persecution to come to our lives. I'm not even necessarily expecting in the near future any great persecution to come into our lives. And yet do we as the body of Christ sense 
fellow believers around the world that are encountering great persecution and suffering in their, their lives? Do we sense as a family and connect with them, pray for them? Do we understand that in our lives that the, 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 the little that we are facing, we must stand against? We must stand against so that we can bring glory to God and strength to others. Do we deny Christ by not obeying his word when it is uncomfortable for our flesh? Inconvenient to our schedule. Embarrassing in front of others. Do we live for him constantly in our lives?